Bobby, you're fixing to start the Global Energy Budget Lab, and I want to give you some advice on how you can have an optimal lab experience. The very first thing I would recommend is that you watch the lectures over climate change because the terminology matters. So I will tell you that the general person would think of a positive or a negative for climate being a better or a worse climate condition. When we talk about positive and negative forcings in climate and positive and negative impacts, we're actually referring to temperature changes. So when something's in the positive, it means it's in the red. It means that you have a warming occurring. When it's in the negative or the blue, which you'll see in this lab, it means that we have cooling temperatures occur. So either way, the climate's going to shift and change and the conditions will change based on if we have positive or negative feedback slash forcings, and you'll be learning more about that. So basically, the storyboard is this. We have a certain amount of solar radiation that comes in from the sun. Some of that automatically gets reflected back to space because of our cloud cover and our atmosphere. Then some actually makes it through, and that helps warm up the planet. So if we have a whole bunch of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, more heat will be held. If we have less, then more can escape back out into space once we've had some absorbed by the land and ocean and then some reflected back. So that brings me to a terms uh, or a set of terms called albedo. Albedo in climate change refers to how reflective the Earth's surface is. So I'd like you to think for a minute if we have a really, really dark surface that's covered by, let's say, tropical rainforest, that's going to be very green, very dark, that would allow for more solar radiation to be absorbed at the surface. When we have uh, land surfaces that are very light in color, meaning they're white, or maybe even a light sandy color, more light and energy can be reflected back to space. So we would have a, an albedo that would cause a cooler climate. So while it may seem backwards, you're like, well, we think it's great to have tropical rainforest. Well, certainly it is for uh, utilizing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and so forth for the nitrogen cycle and carbon cycle, but there can be some shifts in climate. This is the basic energy budget map, and it's showing how much solar energy is coming in in watts per squared meter. Why that's important is that's how energy is measured. If we have a balanced climate, we should be essentially having the same amount coming in and going out, and things would stay at an equilibrium. But if we change one dynamic, such as we have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that could retain heat, then we could end up having a positive feedback, which means we'd have a warming situation. So let's say we have a very reflective surface that's covered in glaciers. We are in an ice age. The opposite would be true. We would have a negative feedback slash forcing type situation where we would have a lot of energy reflected back to outer space, cooling the overall global climate. So as you're looking at these different numbers, you need to be looking at specifically when you take your assessment, if it's asking about, okay, am I looking at the amount of uh, reflection of clouds and atmosphere, and this would be your number, if you're looking at the ocean here, so I want to talk about the ocean for a minute. The ocean's like our super store of extra carbon that we get on Earth. In fact, it holds more carbon than anything else on Earth does, which is problematic because of this reason. So over millions of years, we can store an incredible volume of excess carbon in the oceans making rock like limestone. And when the ocean starts to heat up because of climate change, then that can cause acidification. 
And that warming and acidification eats away at limestone. Limestone basically dissolves away in the presence of acid. Well, that's going to cause carbon dioxide to get released. And so you can see there could be a runaway problem with that, right? So that's a good thing in terms of the Earth's ocean being our basically climate regulator. And throughout geologic time, we have seen shifts where we've had cooling trends, where massive glacial periods occurred. Then we have massive warm-ups. The very different aspect to the current climate situation we have is that humans weren't a part of the other ones. Okay, So we're having an aggravated situation occur because of what's called anthropogenic contributions, which is human added elements to greenhouse gases that would not be there except for natural resources like volcanoes or massive meteorite strikes that causes large wildfires around the globe. Well, now we have actual human sources of these same events that also are happening in nature. So you couple that together and it's basically too much. I use an equation of this. I'd like you to think about your favorite pie at Thanksgiving. And let's assume if you had a grandma that made it, or maybe you're a great cook and you make that, and you ate 100% of that pie over Thanksgiving, you would likely put on some weight if it was a highly caloric pie, unless you ran multiple marathons to burn it off, right? Because you took in too many calories. If you did that a little bit at a time, you probably would not see the same result. So that matters when we're talking about the budget, not it literally with pie intake, but it's essentially the same thing with the amount of greenhouse gases we have. If there is a steady equal amount, even if we get higher levels of let's say sulfur dioxide or carbon dioxide or methane, which is a really like super bad greenhouse gas in terms of its ability to hold warmth, if it's slow and steady, the atmosphere may be able to absorb that and use it, burn it up. But if it happens too quickly and there's too much of it, it's an excess. And so something has to happen to make the climate stabilize. So that's the purpose of this lab, is for you to discover going through what the climate budget is and then applying that in scenarios in real life about what that might look like in terms of positive and negative climate impacts. You will also be to look at this radiative forcing chart. And I wanna take a second to define this. This is a really good indicator of what I was talking about earlier with the red and blue. If you notice the zero line on the X axis basically me measures in watts per squared meter. So at zero, that's a flat line. Anything that's above, that's a plus number above zero would be considered a positive forcing. Anything beneath it that has a negative number would be a negative forcing. And again, positive does not necessarily mean a good thing for climate when we're talking about climate change. It simply is a mathematical number that equates to having a positive balance, meaning above zero. And anything that has a negative balance does not necessarily correlate to being a bad thing. It simply means it has a negative mathematical value for watts per square meter. To bit it, put it bluntly, anything that's in red is going to cause warming. Anything in blues are going to cause coolings. So if you see really radical big red bars, that means you're going to have lots of warming potential. If you see very large blue bars, that means you'd have a climate cooling. And in order to adequately describe this process, it is only right that we would examine both coolings and warmings. And that is why climate change should always be discussed in that context. Follow the directions in the lab and you'll do a great job. Thanks, bye.